hi, my name is Thais Gorkova. Um, I used to be at Slack, uh, at the Slack National Laboratory in the US. And uh, recently I've moved to, um, uh, to Germany, to Hamburg. And um, I will be talking about the experiments which I performed during my time at Slack, mostly. Um, and um, I would like to, to, um, to admit <laughs> that in contrast to other speakers here, I'm by no means an expert in attosecond sources um, or even attosecond science. Um, my background is X-ray imaging or development of new X-ray imaging techniques using free electron lasers. And um, I kind of I stumbled into <laughs> attosecond science because I was there at the right place at the right time when LCLS decided um, to make um, FEL pulses really short, in fact, 200 to 500 attosecond short. And this, this, the special property we had was that the pulses were really intense. And I will show you in a couple of minutes how intense they actually are. Um, and this new capability, I think, opens really a new era for attosecond science because it really uh, broadens our capabilities to apply nonlinear effects or exploit nonlinear effects in spectroscopy or imaging. Um, tomorrow you will have an entire day about attosecond spectroscopy. And again, I'm not an expert in that, so I will not really talk about that. I will talk to you about my interests. And again, my interests are in ultra-fast X-ray diffraction. And I would like to briefly motivate uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. So this is, um, this is a figure from the website, LCLS website. LCLS is a free electron laser at Slack, um, where you can see the basically the connection between space, spatial and temporal um, um, scales. Um, and as you can easily see, if you go to smaller objects or if you want to resolve smaller objects, um, it's, it's really hard to do this with optical techniques and um, in generally it's not easy to get really towards atomic resolution. And if we do that, um, the, the current state of art is, uh, for example, electron microscopy or X-ray crystallography. Um, and um, in, in normal case, the problem there is that as you go to um, if you're trying to increase your resolution and you're imaging small structures, you need a lot of flux uh, in order to create a bright image so that you can resolve the structure, but to have the high flux, uh, you need a certain exposure time. And this inherently limits your time resolution. And if you think about it, it might be actually much more dramatic than we think, because um, I would like to show you kind of an intuitive image of, of where we are today with our nano um, nanoscale imaging methods mostly. Um, and this is going back in a history of, uh, of photography. Um, and this is uh, the first picture taken of a human being here. And um, this was taken, recorded by a pinhole camera. And as you know, with a pinhole camera, you need a really um, uh, long exposure time. And what you see here is a, it's not even called a photograph yet, it's a daguerreotype uh, made by Louise Daguerre in 1838 uh, of a boulevard in Paris. And this was uh, done in broad daylight. Um, and you can see that the, the buildings um, and the trees, they are very nicely resolved because they are standing still. Uh, but you see only one person on the street. And this person, this is somebody whose shoes were cleaned at the time. <laughs> so this person was standing still for several minutes. And this is the only person you see on a really crowded boulevard. And the other people, they are completely washed out because you needed this large exposure time. And as they moved, they didn't leave a trace in the image. So now, if you imagine, <clears throat> using an electron microscope, this is our current capabilities to see the nanoscale world. 
And as you can imagine, if you go to nanoscale, um, processes can also get pretty fast. So it, it's really hard to capture them. And again, as I briefly mentioned in the very beginning, this is kind of um, the dilemma of most imaging techniques um, can be summarized in the dilemma of the pinhole. Um, so if you want to have a sharp, crisp image, crisp image, um, you will use a small aperture. Um, but if you have a small aperture, your image um, takes a long time to build up. Now, if you, if you want to have a high temporal resolution, so you want to resolve people walking, then you need more light and then you need to increase your aperture. Um, but then your image gets blurred. And um, one truly visionary idea to overcome this was using free electrons lasers for X-ray diffractive imaging in, in, at the nanoscale. And um, the basic principle is called diffraction before destruction. And the pioneering work or kind of the, the, the ground uh, groundwork was laid in 2000 when uh, a paper appeared uh, by Richard Neutze um, and, and Janusz Haidu and, and, and this group, um, where they proposed that one could image biomolecular um, samples using intense X-ray pulses before they get destroyed. So the way it works is you, you can see this in figure A here. So the sample or the biomolecular sample is coming from the top, is dropped from the top into the path of the X-ray FEL beam. The X-ray FEL beam provides bursts or flashes of coherent intense X-rays and illuminates the sample. Now, of course, um, as you know, X-rays are highly damaging. So, so a lot of ionization is going on. And with intense X-rays, ultimately the sample will explode. But because this burst is so short, as passing through the sample, uh, it sees that the sample is still intact and creates a diffraction image on a detector which is placed further downstream. And it captures the, the sample, the structure of the sample before the destruction of the sample. And this is why it's called diffraction before destruction. Um, and there are ways, if you have reproducible samples, how you can um, um, uh, record multiple imaging images similar as in cryo-EM and then correlate them and create, uh, create three-dimensional maps. Um, this is currently in development and there are first very interesting results from that. And I wanted to show you what has been done so far. So um, these are just a few examples of things which were visualized, which were not seen before, which were not visible before because of this um, property that you now can see transient uh, um, states of matter, basically. So one, one of the first studies um, was uh, done by, by the group of Mike Bogan at LCLS, um, where they created a source of soot particle to study combustion products. And what they found is that the morphology uh, of, of, the, of soot is just much more diverse than you see from uh, electron micros uh, 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 microscopy images. Basically, when the samples are attached to a surface after the combustion process, so they could show that the process is in, of combustion is in fact much more complex than previously anticipated. Then here on the left, um, uh, there was a, a, a group uh, from uh, Daniel Rupp uh, and Thomas Müller and Thomas Fennell who studied the formation of uh, metal nanoparticles. And what they found is that um, some, some methods to generate nanoparticles, especially through laser ablations, um, the formation process, it, it, it contains some transient shapes which are not visible and which cannot be detected later when the sample or when the nanoparticles are later attached to a surface and studied under an electron microscope. Um, then there is this example of uh, imaging of living cyanobacteria, um, which is particularly interesting because it's going towards bioimaging. And then again, it kind of shows the potential that, yes, the <laughs> bacteria will be dead after this exposure, 
Um, uh, but but during the exposure, you can actually study the living things and uh, the living thing, and you don't have to kill it before. Um, and then another very cool study um, uh, could prove that um, superfluidity, superfluid nano droplets, uh, form vortices, transient vortices, and they could visualize that. And this added to our knowledge of properties of superfluidity in general. Um, there's a really big effort going on to advance biological imaging and to go towards 3D imaging with this technique. Um, and one prominent example is the single particle imaging, which is um, uh, which can be found at LCLS, but also at the European uh, 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 um, XFEL. And um, they are kind of different leaders, but that's a very similar community. And this is a community effort to really try to advance this technique to higher and higher uh, sp uh, spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, but um, as you can see, this technique relies on FELs because we need this intense pulses. And I just wanted to briefly dive into the history of X-ray sources just to show you how unique the technology of FAL is, historically speaking, and how much progress has been done in the last decades. Um, so if you, if you look at the beginning of, of X-ray sources, and this is the time where Rosalind Franklin uh, determine the DNA structure. This was still done by, by basically something like Bremsstrahlung, so by a Kupfer K alpha rotating anodes. And um, it's quite remarkable that uh, despite kind of this limited, very limited flux, what you see here is the brilliance on the y axis, and the brilliance is something like. Um, how monochromatic and forward directed the radiation is. And if you look at what kind of source um, Rosalind had at the time, it's it just really, every time I look at this image of the DNA structure, um, it, it, it just blows my mind that she could use this image to determine the DNA structure or that somebody or others could determine the DNA structure. And then, um, after, after this period, there was kind of a period of stagnation a little bit. And then um, the X-ray science kind of parasitically <laughs> attached to accelerator scientists because X-rays were kind of a parasitic byproduct in, uh, in, in uh, circular particle accelerators. So any type of oscillating particle accelerators will produce X-rays if the energies are high enough. And this basically um, uh, prompted the generation of synchrotron radiation, which increased the brilliance. And at some point, these particle accelerators were built not for particle acceleration or for electron acceleration, but rather for creation um, of X-rays. And this is basically um, here the third um, generation synchrotrons, this is the synchrotrons we have today, and they can provide already a lot of flux and can do amazing things for imaging. Specifically, they, um, they were and are crucial uh, for biology in terms of enabling uh, X-ray crystal um, structure determination and other things, material science. Um, but in the recent decades, to the last two decades, another revolution happened. And this revolution is the um, basically the onset of uh, FELs. The FEL principle you can see here on the left, um, it uh, consists of an bunch which is injected into an undulator. And um, the electrons are really fast. They, this is, uh, uh, they are relativistically fast. And at some point, um, the radiation from this electron starts to microbunch this electrons. And this is what you can see here. And um, this microbunches, they are smaller than the wavelength which is emitted from the electrons. And if that happens, then the electrons emit light coherently. So that means that the power goes not with n, uh, n meaning the number of electrons, but with n square. 
Um, so this makes this machines really special because first of all, uh, you get really short pulses out of it. So with, with uh, synchrotrons, it's rather, I think, hundreds of picoseconds. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there are some, some shorter ones. Um, here you go straight into the femtosecond regime. Um, second thing is you get per shot 10 to 11 to 10 to 13 X-ray photons in a single shot. And these are uh, um, pulses which are highly monochromatic. So what you get is not only temporal coherence, but also spatially coherent X-rays, um, which are ideal for coherent imaging. Um, and right now, so the first um, hard X-ray laser LCLS went online in 2009. Um, and in the last decade, there has been really um, kind of an explosion of these facilities. And now you can find such facilities in Asia and in, in, in Europe and in the United States. So it's a really good time <laughs> to jump in because now uh, the, the former bottleneck we had was the beam time because there were only one of the facilities worldwide and everybody was fighting really hard. And it's still sometimes hard to get beam time, but now it's just a little bit more relaxed. So it's a really good time for method development and anybody who's interested in this kind of science, I think this is the right time to jump uh, on this train. Um, and um, yeah, I will be talking about experiments which I performed here in California um, at LCLS. Um, and um, this is a picture of LCLS. It's a lot, <laughs> a lot of vacuum tubes. And this is the AMO end station. This is where we performed the, the, um, the experiment, while this is uh, the underlayer section, I believe. Um, and um, here on the bottom, what you see is basically an area, area picture of the whole, of, of the whole uh, facility. And it's, I, I believe, in total something like three kilometers long. So it's, um, it's a really amazing facility, especially if you consider that it's been built initial, the, the, the accelerator part uh, has been built, I believe, in the 60s. Uh, and it's still delivering very interesting experimental results. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a, a couple of years, actually, I think it was two years ago, um, uh, LCLS entered into a new regime. Um, and um, everybody who is interested in that, um, this is the paper. This is the first paper showing um, that um, uh, we now can create tunable and isolated. So this is not um, high harmonic CCOMs but it's tunable isolated up to second X-ray pulses with gigawatt peak power from a free electron laser. Um, the technology is called XLEAP and it works for soft and hard X-rays. And just to show you um, how amazing this technique is and what the potential of this technique is, here's a, an overview over um, the, the sources, the current sources we have for auto second pulses. And as you can see here, this is, this is I think, all HHG. Um, and this is a pulse energy per shot, I believe. Um, so this is what is what state of art is um, with tabletop setups. And this is where XLE brought us. And the XLE pulses were between 300 and 500 auto second pulses. Um, and they can go up. So the first they were demonstrated from, I believe, something like 100 EV to about 1000 EV. And you can see um, that we saw pulses up to 100 millijoules per, per, per shot, basically. And this catapults up to second signs in the nonlinear regime. So why is this interesting? Um, if you look at the very basic mechanisms what happens um, upon X-ray excitation. So this is what you see here on the right side. Uh, the first thing, of course, and most likely thing what happens is photo excitation. So one electron is kicked out um, of a shell and um, the system uh, will relax because this is an inner shell and electrons were kind of dropped down uh, in order to, to, shield, to shield the charge. 
And uh, what happens is um, the fastest and the most efficient is Auger decay. And the other very efficient thing is fluorescence decay. Uh, and this is all on femtosecond time scale and on picosecond time scale. So when you go to attosecond time scale and you really induce um, uh, X-ray damage using attosecond pulses, um, what you will get is that you beat all, all the decay processes. So this enables you, for example, to uh, apply impulsive Raman uh, in spectroscopy and also um, interesting imaging, interesting nonlinear mechanisms for imaging, which I will be talking about a bit later. But first, I wanted just to introduce you the first the leader of this project, this is Ago Agostino Marinelli, who is uh, uh, at Slack and he's an assistant professor at Stanford. And um, this is his project. And it's a brief sketch how, how this generation works. So um, what you can see here is that a, an electron beam or a bunch is coming into a, a wiggler. And this wiggler introduces a modulation um, uh, between energy and time, basically. And um, that's, that's a non-trivial thing because um, the original idea was to have the electron in a wiggler and then the modulation is should have been produced uh, by an infrared pulse. But this is it's not trivial to kind of synchronize the infrared pulse and the and the um, electron pulse. So this is why uh, Argus team came up with this, I, I think, really genius idea to use the electron bunch itself, as you can see here. So this is the tail of the electron bunch, and this is the head. And the tail generates itself a CEP stable IR pulse, which then modulates energy. Uh, uh, of the electron beam, beam in time. And this modulation is then turned in a, into a magnetic chicane. And this magnetic chicane, basically what it does is that it, um, uh, it slows fast electrons down and it, it, it uh, uh, um, speeds up electrons which are, which are slow. Uh, that's enough correctly. So yeah, basically it, um, uh, it, uh, if you have an energy, uh, a spread, it, it pushes energies to, or electrons together. And what you get is the uh, current spike. So this is, uh, this is uh, what you will get after the chicane. And this current spike is then used, uh, is, is um, uh, injected into underlayer and creates the X-ray pulses, which are then um, guided through a beamline system uh, into into uh, the experimental chamber, uh, where a team around James Krein, who is also a, a Slack um, uh, scientist, uh, where they applied circular streaking uh, to measure the the pulse duration, um, and this is the setup shown up here. And they could confirm on shot to shot basis that the short that the most pulses are in fact shorter then 500 to second. Um, now, I know that many people from the um, spectroscopy, uh, from spectroscopy side are very excited about this technique and rightly so. Um, as, I, as I said in the very beginning, I'm an imaging person and one might ask, why is XLEAP interesting for imaging? Well, there are two explanations. And the first thing is, that in the dream experiment, um, if you manage to establish nonlinear X-ray spectroscopy techniques in order to study, study charge transfer or energy transfer and chemical reactions and, and other, other complex mechanics on basically on the nanoscale or on the, on the molecular scale, as you will scale up your systems, which you want to study, they will become really complex. And um, in that case, what you really want is you want to combine spectroscopy and imaging in order to know what do you what is the spectroscopy actually about. So I think this combination will be crucial once these methods are being scaled up 
to work with complex specimen. And it's been, we've already shown in the past um, that X-rays or X-ray diffractive imaging can be successfully used to study dynamics and actually real dynamics which are usually hidden in, uh, in, in other types of experiments, for example, gas, gas um, ionization experiments. And um, I would like to briefly give you one example. This is an experiment which we done, which we did in 2010, I believe. So it's already pretty old, but it captures um, the essence of the capability we have if we combine imaging and spectroscopy. So this is this is the very one of the first experiments which we ever performed at LCLS. And what we did here is we injected uh, nanoparticles. Uh, xenon clusters, in fact, um, into the FAL focus, many of them. And we um, had an ion time of light spectrometer, which you can see here. So we basically recorded ions. This, you can see the time of flight here on the y axis. Um, and you can see the yield of the ions on the, on, on the, uh, sorry, on the x axis, you see the time of flight, and on the y axis, you see the yield of the ions. Um, and one question we wanted to study is that um, if, you, if you want to understand how ionization, especially nonlinear ionization processes work, it's really interesting to go from atoms to small nanoparticles to bulk, to bulk. And small nanoparticles, they give you something like nanolabs to study where, where is this transition that, you know, ionization dynamics change. And this has been done with I, uh, intense IR lasers for decades before. Um, and what we've seen was kind of really similar to what people have seen for decades in, uh, with intense infrared light. So if we just um, injected atomic xenon gas, we saw charge states up to xenon 26 plus, which is already pretty high. So there were multi-photon uh, processes going on and nonlinear processes clearly happening. Um, but now if you switch from atomic xenon to just clusters and many of them in the focus, um, you see that suddenly <clears throat> there are also all these low charge states. And these low charge states have been always attributed to nanoplasma dynamics, um, which, and this was said all the time, that, that happened in every cluster which is there in the focus that the combination that the particles they explode slow and there's enough time so that the charge states kind of recombine. So the electrons are recaptured um, with the ions. And this was really kind of the, 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 the working picture because as you can see, we changed the power density in the FEL focus quite a bit actually by two orders of magnitude and still the most prominent charge state was xenon plus, plus one and two. And the charge states, the higher charge states, they kind of rose, but they were never the dominant part. So the explanation, this is a nanoplasma effect. Um, we had to throw this explanation away once we introduced imaging. And I can explain you why. So we changed multiple things in the next setup. First of all, we, we, we analyzed uh, each data point on each shot basis. So we captured and analyzed each shot. We didn't average or multiple shots. Um, then we made sure that only one particle is in the focal volume. And this is very important because the focal volume is a distribution of power densities or intensities. So actually your system always sees all these intensities all together. And this is where you get your signal from. If you now switch to single nanoparticles, that's not the case anymore. The particles are much smaller than the focus. So they experience a unique intensity. So it's really precise if you study um, uh, if you study nonlinear effects because now you have signal which is uniquely related to the intensity the particle is in, and um, we added imaging so we could sort out the diversity in the particle jet. No normally there is a size distribution. Sometimes there are multiple particles, sometimes particles are stuck together. So we could throw this all out based on the diffractive imaging. Now a brief explanation how diffractive imaging works. This is what you heard in uh, Physics 101 when studying diffraction on a sli slit. So if light diffracts from a slit, um, you get a, a spherical wave 
And um, this uh, wave is generated basically in each point in, in space at the slit. And um, then you get an interference pattern and the ring size here, or basically the width of this pattern, this is inversely, uh, uh, this is proportionally, in inverse proportionally to the size of the slit. And um, what we imaged were not slits, so it's not 1D, but 2D, so it's a pinhole. So what you get is like you would diffract, uh, uh, you would get if you diffract a laser from a circular uh, pinhole, you get a pattern. And again, using basically the width of this airy pattern, you can project them on a one dimensional graph. Um, using the width of the rings, you can determine the size um, uh, of, your, uh, of your pinhole or in 3D, you can do the same thing in 3D and then it becomes a sphere. Um, and based on this plot, you can even uh, compare different shots with different brightness because now you can just choose the same size and just see um, how much scattering or how much intensity this, this uh, pattern have and you relatively now can compare the shots. And this is what we did. So um, on, the, on the bottom part, what you see is again a time of flight graph of this is just um, xenon uh, xenon ions, uh, atomic ions. And what you see here is we see some high charge states up to 26 plus almost, some high charge states and no one or two plus because we, we ionize core, core levels. So it's very unlikely that uh, a xenon one plus will remain. And then we write the power density in the focus just using again multiple clusters and um, this is without the imaging. So this is just reproducing previous results and we could see yes, here the one and two and three plus, they're really dominant. And if we go uh, an order of magnitude higher in intensity, um, um, then you get slightly higher charges. So very similar to the previous experiment. The dramatic change happened when we went to um, the single shot data. So each ion spectrum here is uh, a, uh, correlated to an image. And this image has been selected according to the brightness and the size. So the sizes are similar. Everything is similar. The only difference is the brightness of the images. And as you can imagine, if you're close to the focus center, um, then the image will be really bright. And if you're somewhere, if your particle is somewhere in the focal wings, the, 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 the image will be dim. And we discovered that there's actually a gigantic difference between going between several orders of uh, magnitude and, and FEL uh, power density. What we've seen, in fact, that if you if the part, nanoparticles was very close in the center, uh, we did not see any one and two and even barely seen on four plus. So we, we saw this dramatically narrow high charge state distribution. And um, if the particle was barely visible on the detector, the ion spectrum uh, sh was showing one and two plus. So in the end, what we concluded is that this one and two plus peaks, they mostly come from the focal wings and this um, they disappear if the clusters are hit in the center. And this is a signature of much faster explosion than anticipated. And uh, this publication actually sparked a, a big discussion among the the uh, theoreticians, be, which went then uh, along the lines that that might be that they the atoms are combined, but they are Rydberg atoms. But again, um, just to stress that this method, combining spectroscopy and image, it really provided a unique insight through this precision approach to study nonlinear effects. Another obvious um, uh, um, uh, advantage if we use um, really short pulses is, um, and that's another study not done with attosecond pulses, but um, with femtosecond pulses, where we could show that with uh, X-ray FALs, you can uh, create basically movies with femtosecond and nanometer precision. And in this experiment, what we did is we preheated xenon clusters or superheated it with um, really short uh, near infrared 
my uh, uh, laser pulses. And then we came at a delay and probed uh, this basically superheating state uh, with an FAL. And again, we looked at the spectroscopic data and at the images. And the images showed us that um, the infrared laser actually damages this a nanoparticle and heats it much, much faster than we initially thought. And uh, it revealed that this nano, the way the, 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 the uh, deposited energy in this nanoparticle is released is that it starts to melt from the outside towards the inside. So basically what happens that after already 100 femtoseconds, there is a significant melted uh, uh, shell um, and this uh, melted chair surrounds a still intact core and this core kind of melts with time. And then this creates this really paradox situation. And this is why we could not explain our data. So what you can see is that our images, um, the, the rings, this um, very pattern like rings, um, they become broader. And um, if they become broader, it means that the particle becomes smaller. And we thought this is absurd that if we image something which is exploding, um, that we see something that it becomes smaller. Um, and the answer is that the image is always dominated by the, by the re uh, basically region with the highest particle density. And this is this melting core, which is still intact. And this is what we were imaging. Um, this was a very interesting study. And this is what you can do now with ultrasecond pulses. This is, this is a theoretical paper. You can uh, use the same technique and, for example, study transient uh, gratings or all this kind of uh, plasma effects which has been predicted. This is a prediction of what happens inside a nanoparticle which is superheated by an intense optical laser. And this is, as you can see, this is on the two femtosecond time scale. And the prediction is that there's really interesting reflections and transient gradings going on and other phenomena which kind of allow you to, to create very exotic states of matter. And this is something with attosecond pulses, this is something we can actually image. Um, so this is what you can do to use X-rays to study ultrafast dynamics, right? So going back to, to, to my initial slide, why I think this is interesting. But for me personally, I have to admit that actually the other <laughs> direction is even more interesting. And the other direction is, can ultrafast nonlinear dynamics actually serve X-ray imaging? And based on our experiments, um, uh, which are not published, but hopefully close to publishing, and which I will share with you in a second, um, I believe that the answer is yes, and that we actually, with X sleep and with auto second X rays, we might lift some barriers which are currently um, kind of standing in the way of higher spatial resolution of coherent diffractive imaging with uh, X ray FELs. Um, so, one thing which is obvious is that in diffraction before destruction, um, it's, it's good to have a short exposure, right? Because the first thing, as, you, as you've seen before, what is happening is all this photoionization and then the relaxation process cascades. And um, this cascades, uh, you have a nano sample, release electrons, and these electrons are then captured by the space chart of this uh, nano specimen, and they um, keep the heat on, on this, on this um, nanoparticle. And this is why the particle is ultimately destroyed. And if uh, the energies of the electrons are really high, which they are, for example, on the hard X-rays, this can happen on a few femtosecond times. So here is one study performed by Fei, by Fei Ho from uh, ANL. This is um, the theoretician we were working with on this experiment. And his prediction for the flux which is needed for atomic resolution images uh, will actually, as you can see here, require pulses that are shorter than five femtoseconds at least. So if you see here the time scale, already after four femtoseconds, you see some damage. So um, it is really crucial increasing the spatial resolution 
going forward with this to decrease the egg free exposure. But it's not only that. Um, actually, if you think about it really closely, what limits um, the, the spatial resolution in coherent defective imaging? Um, and the, the current limitation is the signal in, in higher angles, in higher scattering angles. So um, this is a very good publication I can recommend everybody to read about those requirements, um, which are needed to re get really almost atomic resolution images with CDI. And what it says is that um, in principle, if the diffraction pattern can be recorded on a large solid angle, the spatial resolution is only limited by the wavelength of the X-rays. In practice, however, the signal resolution is limited by the largest scattering angle up to which a significant diffraction signal can be detected. This angle depends on the coherent dose applied to the sample. Um, and the last sentence is, <laughs> is really, tough to recognize. This means that an increase in resolution by one order of magnitude requires an increase in coherent dose on the samples by four orders of magnitude. Um, so let's think, where does this come from, right? Let's just uh, have a step back and think about how are actually X-rays diffracted by matter. The very basic uh, um, um, definition is that the scattered intensity is the, the number of photons you put in times your coherent scattering cross-section sigma, which will come up uh, frequently in the coming slides. So this is, this is what you need to know, right? So this is the definition of the coherent scattering cross-section. Um, now the coherent scattering cross-section for single electrons um, is the well-known Thomson scattering cross-section, and it's really small. Um, now, we don't have free electrons in our samples, but most electrons we scatter off are actually bound. Um, and to simulate that, um, we can ask ourselves, so the bound electrons, they usually they cluster together around the core, so their distance is smaller than the wavelength. Um, and this is the difference between just randomly distributed free electrons um, and here's, of course, the question, does the scattering cross-section of uh, a number of electrons for X-rays with wavelength uh, lambda differ depending on the distance between the electrons? And the answer is yes, because if, uh, the, cluster, uh, if the electrons are really close together, their scattering cross-section is proportional to the number of electrons squared. And if they're really far apart, their phases do not up coherently and their scattering cross-section is proportional to just their number. Um, and now if you do the math and you go into an object where there are a lot of many bound electrons um, and you, you um, um, calculate basically the X-rays as an incoming plane wave with a K vector, K wave vector, and they are scattered elastically into higher angles. Um, and the different vector is Q. And Q is uh, sinus scattering uh, angle divided by lambda, roughly. So what you see is that overall, if you scatter off something, um, the scattering cross-section is angle dependent. Um, and if you really do the math, you will see that the scattering is actually somewhat related to the Fourier transform of the electron density of your, of your object. Um, and um, if your Fourier transform, for example, a sphere, and this is very similar again to what we've seen before with the aperture diffraction pattern, you get this airy pattern-like um, uh, behavior. And as you can see, um, the signal, so this is the intensity of the scattered um, photons it decays dramatically as you go to higher Q and the higher Q this is where the higher um, resolution is stored um, and in fact it goes oops with Q uh, power minus four um, and um, this is the reason why uh, increase in order 
of one magnitude in, in spatial resolution requires a coherent dose which is four orders of magnitude higher. Um, there is a really intuitive side or explanation to this, again, just to look at it from another, coming from an angle, if you just look at it from Fourier optics side, and as you can see, so this is here from uh, Goodman, this is a picture, I, or Salem, I, I'm not sure which book, um, um, this is a, a portrait from Fourier, and you can basically <laughs> always um, get this, this, this picture by uh, adding discrete, um, uh, waves uh, and this is how you can recreate every image and this is what diffraction basically does. Every k vector um, or q vector represents a certain wave pattern uh, um, in, 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 the, in the Fourier space and um, if you now take the portrait of Fourier on your Fourier transform it, this is what you get. You get some sort of speckles and now um, if you don't have the high scattering angles, basically all this part, if this is missing, and now you book back for uh, uh, your transform it, then the image is blurred. And this is how you see this is actually this low pass filter behavior. So the missing high Q information, this is what costs your resolution. And now going back to the very basic problem. Um, so, um, if, if we want to have a brighter image in order to get high, high Q information, um, we need either higher uh, intensity coming in or uh, we need to do something with the cross section. So higher intensity coming in is highly non-trivial uh, because it's extremely expensive to scale a VL power. Um, and another, another problem is that if you just um, increase the intensity, you might run into bleaching problems where your sample is damaged uh, during the, the exposure on an electronic level so that your, your sample becomes transparent and you will lose out on this incoming power. So the other option, and this is where the nonlinear part comes in, um, is to try to, to manipulate your coherent scattering cross-section. Um, and when you do that, um, uh, you have to be careful because if you look at the graph on the left side, so here on the x-axis, you have the photon incoming X-ray photon energy. And on the y-axis, you have a, a cross-section in barn per atom. And what you see is that for X-rays over the broadest region, the highest cross-section is actually just photoabsorption, so your sample will get destroyed. Um, and your, your coherent scattering cross-section is usually much lower, orders of magnitude lower, so you have to be really careful that your pulses are short enough that these guys don't um, uh, um, interfere. And um, well, one thing um, we can do is um, we can try to use resonant uh, excitation to increase the scattering cross section. And, and um, resonant excitation is used, for example, in uh, resonant inelastic scattering to, to nonlinearly increase the signal uh, with FELs. It's a little bit more difficult because uh, you, you often have multi photon processes and this messes, uh, messes up the, the resonant line and I can show you how. Um, so the first thing you see here, um, this is a xenon atom and uh, on the x-axis is the radius in, inside the xenon atom uh, and this is the column potential here. Um, and you see this is kind of the inner shells, the three electrons that there are more, of course, but we, we are just dealing with the two of them because we will excite only, we will excite one of them later. And um, this is a scenario if we apply resonance scattering to the 3D excitation of the xenon atoms. So what happens is that we basically drive this uh, transition between the 3D and the 4F shell. And this gives you some sort of increase. 
Um, but the increase in resonance is not really large. And why is that? Well, if you look at the wave functions of the orbitals, they barely overlap. And the overlap is really crucial um, if you... Um, uh, if you if you want your cross section to increase, because this basically gives you the value of this transition dipole moment, right? Um, now, what happens if you scatter off a resonance or short-lived resonance, which occurs after you ionize, basically you kick out one electron of the system? So there are two things which happen. One is really intuitive, and the other isn't. So the intuitive part is that all the uh, energy levels, they get pulled down closer to the now positively charged core or even more positively charged core, and they try to shield this. And the difference between the 4D and the 3D level increases energetically. So the resonance will shift to higher energies. And now a really interesting thing happens. Now, if you look at the orbitals, so you look at the wave functions of 3D and 4F, you suddenly see there is an overlap. Again, because the or orbitals are also kind of pulled closer to the center. And suddenly you can see the uh, overlap by eye. Uh, intuitively, you can already know the cross section, the absorption or scattering cross section, that will be much lower. And why I'm talking about absorption and scattering is in the regime we are dealing with, the scattering absorption, this is two sides of the same coin. So as the scattering goes up, the absorption goes up. And this behavior has been actually observed in the absorption side of the coin. Um, previously, this is, um, this is a paper from Linda Young's group, which is actually from 2011. Um, and what you see here uh, is uh, neon, neon ions and calculations based on what, what they observed. Um, calculations for the absorption cross-section of different neon ions. So what you need to know here is this is the photon energy and the photon energy is close to the K edge of, of neon. And um, the K edge has an absorption cross-section, the literature value you don't see on this graph. So the neutral neon, the black part, you don't see because it's here, right and down there, it's one, it's one mega barn. But this entire graph is dominated by um, resonances which come from one and two and three plus. And the three plus resonance is in fact 50 times more higher, has a 50 times more higher cross section than the neutral neon. And now going back to the xenon problem, and this is what we've done in our experiment. Um, if you now go back and do the same thing for the scattering, so the flip side, um, we see a gigantic increase in, uh, in theory for xenon one plus for a core core hole in the scattering cross section as we go slightly above the classical um, um, uh, um, 3D resonance. So here you have again the incoming uh, X-ray photon energy and the uh, scattering cross section, and as you can see, so this is the neutral curve. Um, uh, and the through line, the red line, this is the xenon one curve, and there's a difference in two orders of magnitude. So this is something we wanted to investigate. And actually this has been observed before in imaging. And I don't want to go into detail with that, but um, the summary of what people observed so far is they use long pulses. And what they observed is that this transient resonances can really degrade your image. And they are actually, they can really mess up the information you get from the diffraction pattern. So we knew we need to go to really short pulses. Uh, and this is what we did. So we compared different pulse durations. We did this experiment, which I introduced in the very beginning with the single clusters where we recorded multiple of them and we sorted them according to brightness. And then we will write the X FEL energy along the 3D, xenol 3D absorption edge. And then we write the pulse duration while keeping most photons at the same, uh, or the pulses at the same uh, photon number. Um, and um, what we observed was really, really surprising. Um, 
So this is some preliminary results. This is um, four diffraction patterns stitched together. And as you can see here, this diffraction pattern um, contain one cluster, which is uh, of a similar size, and it is one of the brightest images we recorded. And um, there's no, almost no difference between uh, five femtosecond and attosecond. So the attosecond images, they produce a little bit even brighter images than, um, than the uh, five femtosecond pulses. And they produce images which are almost as bright as just taking the entire FEL beam, which has usually 50 times more photons than the attosecond pulses. Um, um, the, the difference in the brightness is actually only four. So we somehow with the 200 femtosecond pulses, we lose uh, a lot of, we lose an order of magnitude of photons. And we think we have a clue why. And um, this is some preliminary results where we basically um, see indications that if you now go along the 3D resonance with XLEAP and you look and we, you record the cross section, the scattering cross section from each shot, from each image, what we see is that we do see an increase in scattering if we go um, slightly above the classical edge. So this is, we think this is a, a a clear signature of a um, transient resonance so that in principle you can use really short pulses to increase your scattering cross section and our um, other results which I will not discuss here uh, show that it can go up even up if even more than two or three orders of magnitude in theory. Um, and this is why I personally very excited about this technique. Um, since I've presented some unpublished data, I would like to, to thank um, the team, the wonderful team uh, which performed this experiment. Um, and my very special thanks um, to Stefan, um, who, who used to be at Slack and um, I was really lucky he decided to, to, uh, to continue working with me at the University of Hamburg. And then Ago Marinelli, um, who is the father of Ago Second Pulses, um, and the simulations you've seen are done by um, Faye from ANL from Chicago. And um, just as a last mentioning, um, if you are interested in what we're doing, there will be positions available soon uh, in our group. Please feel free to contact me. Um, we are looking for students and postdocs. Thank you very much. <laughs>